unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. The Christian faith, if I'll start this way, is a place of answers, not a place of questions. That is why there is a consistent pattern in the word from the beginning of human existence and man relating with God as we know it for God to come through as an answer in fact later in the New Testament we see the criticism of men which minister questions rather than godly edification which is after faith because godly edification which is after faith is supposed to be a space of answers so yes we will have questions as long as we live. And we'll always look through the pages of truth to have these answers. And on such times as these, as I pray and I continue to preach, as I make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, as we open the eyes of men, as we cast light through the word, the eyes of the understanding being enlightened, we hope that they will know and see and understand. And when they get these answers, they're transformed. And fundamentally, one of the major questions that I have found in the faith for quite a long time, and as long as I've served God, is a place where certain people don't seem to see the results of their effort. The answers are obscure. They are ambiguous. They are unclear. If I am doing this, why aren't I successful? If I've gone to school and graduated, why don't I have a job? If I eat this way, why aren't I healthy this way? If I do this, why don't I have the result of doing that? If I am going this way, why don't I see the answers and the success that follows people who are supposed to go that way? But it's not the first time that humanity has had such questions. And as we continue to define the person of God in all the facets of faith and understanding, we hope that through that we might give the true understanding of things. And as a man continues to find themselves in these conversations, in these sermons, somehow there's some that breaks spiritually. And a man is aligned for the answers, the success, the results that you're supposed to have. The way of life is a good one. God has ordained life. You know, to be good, especially in the life of salvation. The Bible says, I'm come that you might have life and life to the fullest. You should have it abundantly until it overflows. It's a way of life. But our understanding of God, because it has been diluted, we have been so misplaced in the understanding of that goodness and the way of good. And so because men are so lost, we so much apply our thinking in many things that are not felt after the way and patterns of God. We star the gifts that sort of qualify us before men, but they do not still justify the results that should follow our gifts. We labor so much and earn so little. You know? Yes, we know that the rest is not to the swift, the battle, the strong, neither the bread of men of skill. We know that time and chance happens to us, but then how do we use time and chance how do we use the timing of the spirit and the opportunities that are available for us in the spirit to translate these things? Because God has intended that we should actually reap more than we have sown. This is the way of the spirit. The man sows one seed, and out of that, there's a 30-fold, there's a 60-fold, there's a 100-fold. It's never the way of God for a man to reap the exact seed that he has sown. You know, it's... The receiving of a hundredfold is the receiving of thirty folds, is the receiving of sixty folds. When he's talking about our persecution, he says, You shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands. 
and persecutions, but yes, there's folds. There's folds. And so if I apply myself to work, there are people who have been working for 20 years, but they don't have much to show for it. There are people who have been applying themselves to too much energy in the service of God, but their ministries don't have a voice. They carry no distinction. They carry no mark. They are so lost in things that have no definition. But they are men of God. They are women of God. They love God. They are connected, you know, to his word. They love him. And so we have answers. If I've done all this as I should, why don't I see the results that I should get? And much as what I'm going to share might not apply to everybody, but what I'm going to share will apply to most people in the faith, and especially even those who even think that they are servants of God. There are two prophets that were sent with a definitive mission, and one of which was Haggai. The other was Zechariah. These were prophetic voices that were sent in the time when God wanted to rebuild the temple, the place of worship for the children of Israel. And so they were sent to star the children of Israel to rebuild the temple of our Lord. And so they come with a unique story. Of course, in reference, sometimes they're called the minor prophets. We have major ones, and some people actually don't understand that major minor is simply a referential naming. It's not in any way meant to define the weight of the responsibility and the faithfulness to the assignment of that hour, you see, of which God rewards. So when you say, oh, you're a major, you're a minor, do you know the meaning of that? These were codes that were used to help us identify certain prophetic figures in the Bible, but not necessarily imply that these were men of lesser authority in the spirit. No, rather, these men fulfilled the faithfulness that was required of them to do what must be done. So it's not in the volume of how much the prophet delivers. It's in the faithfulness to the assignment given by God because it's possible to spend yourself even beyond the volume or extend yourself, like Paul calls it, beyond the measure. The rule of measure with which we have been given. That's why he warns us not to exalt ourselves, not to expand and expand ourselves beyond our measure, but according to the rule of the measure that is given us. So, in the first chapter of Haggai, the prophet, the second year of Darius, the king of Persia, and I'll read from the Amplified Version, in the sixth month of the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the means of Haggai, the prophet in Jerusalem, after Babylonian captivity, to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time is not yet come that the Lord's house should be rebuilt, although Cyrus had ordered it done 18 years before a foreign king, had allowed the children of Israel, Cyrus had allowed the children of Israel, God had used his heart to allow the children of Israel to rebuild the temple, and they were delayed by 18 years. Third verse says, And then came the word of the Lord by Hagar, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house of the Lord lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways and set your minds on what has come to you. And he says, You have sown much, but you have reaped little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you do not have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages has earned them to put them in a bag with holes in it. And he says, and thus said the Lord God of hosts, consider your ways, your previous and present conduct, and how you have fared. Go up the hill country and bring lamb and rebuild my house, and I'll take pleasure in it, and I'll be glorified, says the Lord, by accepting as it has done for my glory and the displaying of my glory in it. You looked for much harvest, and behold, it came too little. Even when you brought that home, I blew it away. Why, saith the Lord God of hosts, because of my house which lies west, like you yourselves ran each man to his own house, eager to build and adorn it. Therefore the heavens above you, for your sake withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its produce. And I have called for a drought upon the land and the hill country, upon the grain, the fresh wine, the oil, and upon that which the ground brings forth, upon men and cattle, upon all the wearisome toil of the men's hands. Everything God has put a drought on. And he's saying, because of the waste of mine house. I promise one day to preach about what it means to waste in the spirit. Because like there is a wasting physical, 
There's also a wasting of the spirit. I give an example of a, a story where the Lord feeds 5,000 men. And after that, he says, you know, collect all the remains of the foods and the crumbs, the fragments, and bring them, that nothing be lost. And then they collect them, and there are 12 baskets full because they had to be kept for the day. Well, there was an instruction by God instructing the children of Israel in that time to learn not to waste because certain things are available. But when it comes to the wasting of the spirit, when it comes to the waste stage in the spirit, what does that mean? Because we think that we waste physically, but many of us do not know that actually there is a wasting in the spirit. And God has actually given you an example and spoken of his house. And he says, because my house lies in waste, and each man of you runs to his own house eager to build and adorn it. And he has an issue. So he sends drought on their corn, drought on their oil. Oil there could also mean the anointing is frustrated. The brooks are dried early. The ministry is struggling. The fresh wine is frustrated as well. And fresh wine means the freshness of the revelation that ought to come through a minister. And then as you start to preach, you start to sound not only dull, but like a repeating conversation of a thing that is saying the same thing that was revealed it 20 years ago. It's monumental. But it points not to the future. And then he says that the cattle are droughted and every toil of the hands is dry. If you're a pastor, the ministry is dry. If you're a business person, your business is dry. If you're a career person, your career has a dryness to it. It has a drought to it. If you're a consultant, an engineer, a doctor, there's something about you that is dry. There's an emptiness that has no words of definition. Yet you earn money, you make money. But there's something wanting. You eat, but you're not full. You build, but you don't live in there. You have sown, but you carry no reaping. Because God says in there, we have to learn to consider our ways. Consider our ways. And so the question for the reader then is... What do you mean by the consideration of our ways? As Hegai has given it, in the simplest sentence that I can give, and perhaps we'll take time to build something over it for your understanding, is this, that if you don't learn the right way to serve God, you'll never truly be satisfied with anything in the world. That will say, oh, but I serve God. But do you serve him the right way? Oh, but you know, I'm a pastor. I've been preaching for 34 years. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. How come my ministry is frustrated? Yes, yeah, yeah, it could be. But the question is, do you really serve God in spirit and in truth? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a businessman. I sing in my choir. Oh, I'm an usher in the ministry, but I am frustrated. Yes, to put yourself to the art of work and to busy yourself in the house of God is all acceptable and right for you to do because it's the beginning space that qualifies the whole idea of serving God. But it's more than even the things that we do. And that is why there are people who can serve God in a ministry for years and they have none to show. And there are people who can serve God for two, three years and things change and they go up one. And we can even build doctrines around justifying why, oh, you know, I don't care whether they have that or this happens for them or that happens for them for as long as me. I love God and I'm going to heaven, you know. You can look at outward things and think, hmm, you know, those things are nothing really. The thing is me serving God. You can say all of that and give excuses. But in your heart of hearts, when you go to your bed, what do you ask for? What do you really ask for? What are the desires of your heart? Because it says, I shall give you the desires of your heart. The Bible says in Exodus, the 23rd chapter, from the 25th verse, if you read from the Amplified, he says, you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless your bread and water, and he will take sickness from the midst of thee, and none shall lose their young one by miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. The God that called you to service has a promise to that service. The God that called you to glory and virtue has a reward. He has not called you. Isaiah 65 tells us how he has not called us to seek him in vain, to serve him in vain. Your labor is not into nothingness and wantonness. It's not so. It's not so. He says, I've not called the seed of Jacob to seek me in vain. If you are a real servant of God, a true servant of God, you might not be one which preaches on the altar like me. You might be a servant of God in the security department protocol. 
You might be a servant of God in welfare. You might be a servant of God in just giving. Whatever it is, if you really are a servant of God in spirit and in truth, God has promised that there are certain things that must follow you because of your service. It's supposed to be so. It's supposed to be so. So then I do all these things, yes. And he says, you have sown but reaped little. Oh, yeah, so you're giving your tithes. Thank God, you give your first fruits. You're giving. And we see that giving. But we don't see that first fruit and tithe translating to the results that must follow. Oh, yeah, wait upon the Lord. And yes, you can wait upon the Lord and have a full reward. But what about those who have actually waited of God and they have not really seen the results that should come from their seeding, from their giving, from the sowing? It is because it's one thing to say that we are servants so we love God. It's another to know how to serve God. But also on the other hand, I don't understand how you can understand the salvation story and not serve God. Again, I'm speaking because we are in a more consumer-driven dispensation. It is taking and taking and taking without giving. Our visions have been so misled into looking at the things that we need as men and not the things that we can give toward God considering the things that he has already given us in Christ, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus. And today the altar of Jesus Christ becomes so transactional that a person can go to church the first year they want a visa, the second year they want a car, the third year they want a husband, the fourth year they want papers, the sixth year they want this, the seventh year they want that, and they want to go to service just for the deliverance. So they cast out this, they cast out that, they chase this and they chase that. Oh, I need prayers from this man of God, from this prophet, from this evangelist, from this apostle. We heard that he does this. Oh, from this pastor we had when you enter his ministry you become this and they're seeking and seeking and seeking and seeking for things money can buy but many of them have forgotten that they have been so misled and deceived in the revelation of the person of God so they are simply taking and taking and taking so yes when you bring conversations of sowing to the spirit and how with sowing to the spirit we shall reap life eternal and if we sow to the flesh the Bible says we shall surely reap of the flesh and even the most supposedly holiest prayers and desires fulfilled in our lives they only end up in the justification and fulfillment of the things that touch our sensual pleasures and the flesh and within that end yes we can testify of god's goodness he gave you a car we can testify of god's goodness he gave you a husband and a wife or oh, we can testify of god's goodness he gave you a child oh yeah we can testify of god's goodness he gave you all of that but you see because of such deception, we have disengaged from the true vision of what it means to be truly satisfied of God. And because of that, many believers in the world are settling for so little because their standards have been so lowered by the darkening of the true vision of God. And so I see a man who was supposed to change a hundred million people before they leave the earth, and that man is still striving for a job. And you see the woman whose vision was supposed to touch two, three billion people on the earth in her lifetime. And she's still striving to get married. She's still striving to get a business. And because of that, we even seek for the wrong thing. We pray for the wrong thing. We aspire for the wrong thing. The Bible says we pray and receive not because we ask amiss. But what does it mean to ask amiss? We ask amiss because when we are asking, the mind of God is not truly revealed concerning our destinies. Our milestones are not drawn. Our future is not known. If it's known, it can only be known in part by us consulting those that see in the spirit for us. Because we have diluted the gospel to leaning on the giftings of the spirit and not the person of God. And I'm not saying that the giftings don't have their own place. But these ought to just be confirmations of what is already affirmed in our spirits because God is relational and he wants to relate with me like he wants to relate with you like he wants to relate with the most anointed man or woman in the world. From the first to the least, he says, they shall all know me and none shall tell his brother, know ye the Lord. For from the greatest to the least, the Bible says, they shall all know of me. From the greatest to the least. And so in the journey that we strive, we're seeking again to define relationships. 
because the relationship that many of us have been introduced to as we're walking the life of salvation has been a very lustful relationship, not revelational. It has centered on our needs and not the needs of heaven. And now the children of Israel are found in that stance. Yes, the temple has been broken and there's a grace for them to rebuild it. Cyrus allows them to. Zerubbabel is leading the whole pack. 18 years they're delayed of a thing that God has instructed of them to do. And then we see that while the house of God is lying in wests, they are looking to building their own houses and adorning them. And then we see that when the needs of heaven are frustrated, when the needs of heaven are seeking answers, when God is seeking for men which are available in the hour, he says that they are engaging in the beauty of the things that touch the earth, the things that satisfy their humanness. And then they find themselves sowing because they understand that when you sow, you will reap. And then they reap little because they're missing the major and they're indulging with the minor, you know, and they're drinking, but they don't have enough and they're not filled and they're eating. But somehow in there, there's a space that they just can't feel. They're clothing themselves, but they're still cold and they're not warm. They're earning wages. They put them in bags and those bags as though have holes. In other words, they are making money, but they have nowhere they can locate that money going. They can't explain. There are people who make money, but one year, two, three years, there is nothing that shows for the money that you've been earning. And God is saying, look, you perhaps are in the group that have wasted the things that touch his presence and the things that touch his calling and instructions and you are indulging yourself in doing all as much as you can to survive as an individual. And he's saying, and I will let that emptiness still stay. I will still create space as of to tell you, eat all you want, but you'll never have enough. Drink all you want, but you'll never fill up. Sow all you want, but you'll never reap enough. You'll always reap little. Earn all you want, but you'll always fall out of these bags. Because there is something that you are wasting. There is something wasting. And what is wasting? The things that touch his presence, his person, his ministry, and his law. I have said it once before. That destiny is time bound. That when a man should seek destiny and say, oh, you know, God, what is my destiny on the earth? It is time bound. Because one, you don't live forever in the flesh. But number two, that the milestones God has set in your destiny are all accorded to an appointed time. And I've said it once before that there are signs of an altered world. Right from the generic idea of an altered world. But there's also an individual altered world. Okay? We can say that the world has changed. Back in the day, people never used to do this. Now they do it. That's generic. That's a general form of interpretation. But individually, we have our own worlds too. I have a world of mine. You have a world of yours. You can tell that a world is altered when things are not appearing in their own timing, in the appointed timings of the Spirit. In the appointed timings of the Spirit. In Deuteronomy, the 11th chapter, the 13th verse, if you will read from uh, the New Living Translation, the Bible says, if you carefully obey all the commands that I'm giving you today, if you love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and your soul, the Bible says he will send the rains in their proper seasons. The early and late rains so you can bring in your harvests of grain, your new wine and your olive oil. But underline the word in their proper seasons. That's why I say that the signs of an altered world, things start to appear in the wrong times, in the wrong season. You can have a miracle but at the wrong season. You can have a miracle at the wrong season. And when you have a miracle at the wrong season, it means that you're going to have to build up another space of prayer for the provision of the miracle to fit in the season. For example, if you get married at 70 and you are supposed to get married at 25 or 26 or 30, the world is already altered. Then at 70, if you want to carry children, again, we have to pray for the miracle of your womb conceiving child. So the miracle we're asking for is for it to provide this blessing that you have received in the wrong timing to fit in the timing of the spirit. 
And that is a sign of an altered world. And yes, it can be generic, but it can also be individual. Some of you, the jobs you're doing now, you should have done 10 years ago. Some of you, the relationships that you're building now, you should have built five years ago. Some of you, the plans as ministers that you're having now in your own ministry, these are things you should have been discussing 20 years ago. But you're as one who is beginning today. Why? Because your world is altered and you know not. God has a definitive appointment of time, spiritually, for certain things to happen around you in the course of your destiny. Because you are appointed for a definitive time in human history, and your purpose was drawn against that. Your assignment was drawn against that. Your mandate was drawn against that. Giftings can exist in every dispensation. The Lord is be prophets. The Lord be pastors. The Lord is be healing people. But the mandates will always be tagged to the timing of the Spirit. There are people who are ahead of their time. Because that's the power of revelation. As of God appointing days for you to walk in this course of the earth, it does not mean that by reason of those appointments, you cannot find ways to quicken the miracle. You can quicken the miracle. And likewise, you can stall the miracle. I'll give you an example. For those of you who read the Bible, you know that the first miracle was not in the timing of God. The first miracle that we know was not in the timing of God. So when Mary goes and tells Jesus that, you know, these guys are out of wine, he says, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. It's not yet in the timing of the spirit for me to do a miracle. But this was a woman who knew how to provoke a miracle out of the timing. Yes, there was a definitive time by God. But the power of revelation is the redemption of time. The power of revelation is the redemption of time. God can accord you 10 years to do something, but by reason of access to his revelation, you can shorten those years to five and do it good. It's possible. That spells the liberties of the spirit. As long as you are in the boundaries of truth, there is no problem. So he says, having ears they hear not and having eyes they see not. Their eyes they don't see. But again, when you get into the New Testament, you realize it's not more of their eyes not seeing as opposed to them blinding themselves from the truth they are blinding themselves list at any time the bible says they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and i should heal them it's a should thing but it begins with the opening of the eyes when the eyes are truly open the ears are open when the ears are truly open the heart is open and in the new testament like i said it's a choice. Revelation in the New Testament dispensation is a choice. It's a choice. You choose to avail yourself to the spirit of revelation. Or you choose to define your own revelation and build your own kingdom. It's a choice. It's a choice. The Bible says it's not far. God is not far from us. He's not far. He's so near. He's nearer to you than you are to him. He's available for you. He's available for you. But what are the things you really seek for? That in this damn dispensation, you still find a woman who is praying the whole night for a job. The whole night for her husband to come back. The whole night for her child to quit alcohol. You fast for 20 years because you need one miracle. And the devil has understood them very well that he will keep them on such little small victories that they will lose the picture and vision that God has concerning their lives. The bigger picture. The bigger picture. So he says, when you learn to carefully obey all the commands of God and love him and serve him with all your soul, the Bible says he will send rains in their proper seasons. For those that have dwelt deeper, they can even come earlier. But at least there has to be a proper timing of things in the spirit. At least be on time for everything in the spirit. Then learn to redeem certain things so they can come quicker. But at least learn to be on time for the things of the spirit. Because if you're not, you will always be a story, a proverb, a byword of a life that is so behind in many, 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 many things. Because what's the end of that? If you're sowing and you're reaping little, is that in that little reaping, in the way the frustration of your vision comes. If you're reaping little, it means that you're not going to be able to do the things that you're supposed to do. For perhaps if you had planned to be building at a particular time in your life and you're not yet built, 
that house that you should have built, it's because probably you received little, but yet you were sowing. And God is saying the problem is not in your sowing. I love your sowing, but you are wasting when it comes to the things that touch my purpose, my calling, my house, and my presence. Learn what it means to be a true servant of God and make your decision to really serve God. He will honor you. Learn to serve God. You'll be amazed at the things that you think you needed, you will not need. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the 58th verse, if I read from the Amplified Version, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be firm, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, always being superior in this work, right? Excelling in this work, doing more than enough in the service of the Lord. And he says, knowing and being continually aware that your labor in the Lord is not futile. It is never wasted or to no purpose. The only way you cannot waste in the spirit is learning to excel in your service of God. Don't just be a servant. Excel. Excel. If you are saying, you know, oh me, I can sing, and then you join the choir. Don't just join the choir because you have a good voice. Don't just sing because you are given an opportunity to sing on Thursday or Sunday. Sing with a purpose. Sing with a certain responsibility. I remember before I became a preacher as a worshiper. And there's one thing that I always did when I was going to lead worship. I used to always set aside hours of prayer. Hours of prayer. But I'm leading worship for 10, 15 minutes. Or 30 at most. But I set aside hours of prayer. Yet I'm just going to lead worship for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. Why? Because I need my spirit to be in the most perfect space. That I can give God that worship that so he desires. But there's a worshiper who thinks that you're going to meet with three, four people, rehearse on the songs you're going to sing, and bring your voice and put it on the altar as though you think that God is interested in your voice. God is not interested in your voice. He's not interested in your voice. The Bible says he can even raise stones to worship him. He doesn't need your, your voice. He needs the spirit of the worshiper because the worshiper has to go certain places before you lead men to those places. But how many people honor that space to say, you know, I think I'm leading worship tonight. or I think I'm going to be in worship. Let me create some time of prayer and be with God just about enough to hear him, to minister to the people the way I should minister to them. That kind of person cannot struggle in real life. But sometimes the justification of our gifts deceives us from the responsibility of our fervency for our fervency. For our commitment to the things of the spirit. Oh, yes, I have the spirit of revelation. One time the Lord came, it was like a 4 a.m. And he appeared to me some time back. And he said, I have given you the spirit of revelation. And it works on you for my wisdom. He said to me very clearly. But he said that even though these words will stir you, your defining moment is your place with me. And he told me that it's more than the revelation that I will speak or teach. But where am I with him? What is my place with him? Because even knowledge will cease one day. Even prophecies will be fulfilled one day. Even tongues will not be enough one day, the Bible says. But one thing will abide, and that is agape. The relationship that I share with my God. That goes beyond the things that I will ever teach or preach with anybody. The things I must feel and I must connect to. And that my feelings are awakened beyond the articulation of my mind. To feel after him. To understand him a certain way. Because in there, there are things that I will preach beyond the language that I'm communicating. It will be more than just the things that I can connect in the spirit for a man to understand and be amused and be amused by revelation. It will be the authority from which I speak certain things and the convictions that I array in the hearts of those people because this heart has to seek God a certain way. So it's more than just the gifting. Oh yes, I know great preachers who cannot build ministry because even when they separate themselves to go and seek God, it's lustful. It's not in the space of love. It's not possible to serve God 
and you end in futility. Corinthians has told us. It's not possible to serve our God and then end up with a purposeless life, with a life that carries no direction, no dimension of definition. Yes, these things, the giftings on our lives will always deceive us because many men look at our giftings to confirm us as ministers of the gospel. But beyond the gifting, Paul called it the holy emotion, stirring in their hearts the holy emotion and thus persuading them. But when you look at what he calls holy emotion, it comes in the words of wisdom and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit of God as a proof of the spirit of the power of God operating on man. And as it's operating on that man, if it should only leave the man in the wonder of the miracle, but cannot stir him to holy emotion, then that is not ministry. That man has no full reward. So when we're talking about the laboring, that we might receive the full reward and that we might sustain the things that we have wrought in God. It's more than just the giftings that cause men to be amazed and wonder. Yes, we've been in meetings and eyes have opened, deaf ears have heard, the lame have walked, but our ministry cannot end just when men are bemused by the miracle of the hour. If perhaps a man can see that miracle, but something in that, Takes a holy emotion in him and he will go back home and start to pray and he will go back home and start to seek God and he will go back home and read his Bible not because he's lusting to do the same miracle like Simon the sorcerer not because he's ready to spend the amount of money to buy that miracle like Simon the sorcerer but he is ready to submit himself to the influence and the course of the process that truly makes that man because he's not just seeing the miracle but he feels that he's being invited to a certain realm in the spirit if you do that your ministry has to be a success because you're not wasting in the spirit so what is the wasting in the spirit if perhaps because I know I have the gifting of the spirit enough to make the lame man and the blind eyes see and leave the wonder in the hearts of men but have not carried the wisdom the piety and the fervency of the spirit to invite the man's heart to holy emotion persuading him to come to this God and connect to this word and read this Bible and pray like he should pray if I have not done that even though the miracle is there I have wasted I have wasted so what's the end of your prophecy that men will know you're a man of God or that you're imparting something what's the end of your sermon that people will know that you know the Bible, or that at the end of the day, you'll impart something. What's the reason of your worship? That people will know that you can twist words and voices, ah, like 17 times? Or that as you worship, somebody is invited in a space of glory. I know worshipers who can't move anything in the spirit, nothing. Even when they start worshiping, everything in the spirit realm stays static. But they are approved as worshipers because their voice is good and it's enough to minister to the fleshly part of our lives, the sensual part of our lives, like a man will play nice Mozart and the man feels goosebumps. And because they feel goosebumps, they think that's enough to think that that is the presence of God. We're talking of a worshiper who will worship heaven down and blind men start seeing and deaf ears start hearing and the cripples start walking off their chairs because somebody's worshiping a God they know. If you're not doing that, you are wasting. You're wasting. So a man ought to examine himself even. Are you really serving God? Or at least, how can you be born again and not be serving God somehow? Somehow. How are you able to send your pastor a prayer request, but you're not able to send someone a link to receive life? Where is your vision? You're not able to evangelize to the lost to give them life. But you can easily look for an appointment because you need your marriage to work. And that's okay. God help your marriage. But bigger than that, if you learned to sow to the Spirit, you'd not need to pray for your marriage. If you learned to sow to the Spirit and not waste your moments in the presence of God, you would not need to ask for a job or a car. Understand the things that must come first in the way of the Spirit. Seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he says, and all these things shall be added unto you. These are not things that you should actually pursue or even seek after for prayer. No, these are things that should pursue you because you're a servant of God. That your vision still stays true. God, your vision, the beginning the author the finisher the alpha and the omega that's where your eyes should be 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 there's somebody right now somewhere in the world singing in the choir so a particular person will see them there's a lady ushering in the ministry so the pastor will behold them 
There's a security person standing on the door because he has some dubious plan. And they never know it because when they're serving, you cannot tell they're all serving God. But why do you really serve God? There's some who are simply serving out of convenience. There's some who are serving because they were asked to. There's some who are serving because they have nothing else to do. They have no jobs. They have no money. When they get money, they'll stop serving. For what reason are you serving? So when I ask you the question, how do you really serve God? How do you really serve God and not waste? It's these things, the principles that we've been teaching. Diligence, commitment, excelling in your craft, churning your gift, the fervency of the spirit, the life of prayer, the life of searching out and reading the word, understanding the principles of the spirit, honoring those that teach you the word without grieving your spiritual authority. Because if you do that, the Bible says you'll not profit. It doesn't matter how good a minister you are in the ministry. It's these principles. Being humble. Being faithful. Obeying God in your tithes and your offering. Making it on time when you are needed. It's these things. Taking God serious at his word. Taking the instructions on the altar serious. If the word of God tells you do not blackmail, why do you blackmail? If the word of God tells you do not slander, why do you slander? The Bible says the truth is not in them. And because they do not love the truth, the Bible says God gave them over. Because they don't love truth. Be a lover of the word. Be a lover of the word. Every man who has sought God finds God. Every man who aligns himself to the principles and patterns of the spirit gets the results of those principles and patterns of the spirit. It does not matter if and if a man looks as right as they are. If they don't have the results or the fruit of what they claim to have, there is something missing in the narrative. And if you search it, you'll find it. Every man is where they're supposed to be. Every man is where they're supposed to be. Every man is where they have sown for. Every man is where they have given for. And if a man finds their own way around this without the right pattern, they'll still one day be thrown back to where they truly belong. My point is, learn to fall in love with God and his presence. Learn to do the principles and be a servant of God with your soul, with your heart, with your spirit, with your mind. And give God 100%. That's why he's telling the children of Israel, uh-uh. If you have challenges and you're seeing that things are falling off left, right, and center, you're eating, but you're not getting full, you're drinking, but you're not getting satisfied, you're clothing, but you're not warm. The problem is my house. It is in chambers. Go up. Bring lumber from the mountain and build me a house that I will dwell. Then I'll release the corn, the oil, the fields. I'll release everything that is necessary for you. Why? Because my heart is in my presence. The heart of God is in his presence. It's not outside his presence. Stop looking at God like a shopping mall. Look at God like a God of responsibility toward you and a God of assignments, a God of callings. If you're listening to me and you're not serving God and you are born again, by the grace of God, find something to do in the church of Jesus Christ and do it so well. Excel in it. Give yourself wholly to this. The Bible says your profiting will appear unto all men. I want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, Thank you for the word that you give us this hour. Somebody just open your mouth and speak in other tongues. Just open your mouth and speak in other tongues. Jele brozo boko shatala maya bako salaba. Robo zolo boko zala maya brozo lo poko sikata. Zando robo sikanda la bako sarababa. Raya bako salaba yere bo zalabaya. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Whoever is not serving or has desired to serve but knows not how. Give them the way and the wisdom. And for those that have been busy bodies but not aligned to truth and worship, may you help us serve you the way we must. God, feel, consecrate, sanctify, establish. And help us today even as we heed to this word. 
I also pray for the sick, the bound, struggling families, homes, sick people. Will you be healed of all manner of disease in the name of Jesus? Receive your healing this very hour. I cast that spirit of infirmity and disease out of your life in the name of Jesus. I speak restoration for your job, for your ministry and everything else. But all to the end that you will serve God. You told the children of Israel that I have set them free that they might serve in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now is the hour. You can only say these words. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for my life. I thank you that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. I'm born again today. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Finero, make manifest.